I'm so excited to get down to sit, you know, to sit here with you and chat about what an incredible life and career you've had thus far, even though you're still very young. <laughs> but I mean, you really have sort of paved your own way. Um, and you've done that, it seems like to me, from what I've read and what I've heard from people who are close to you, that you just stayed true to yourself and you've never really veered from that um, and never really compromised your creativity along the way, which I think is quite admirable. Thank um, you. Right? I think that deserves a round of applause. It's kind of the only way to do it, if you ask me. <laughs> And the only female-fronted rock artist to earn seven number one singles in your career? That's kind of insanity. <laughs> I mean... Thank you, guys. It's all because of you guys. I mean, you must be feeling really good about yourself right now. It's, it's not <laughs> a bad feeling. It's kind of surreal. We broke that record or whatever during lockdown, and it was the strangest thing, because it's like, you guys can all have number one singles. It's just a text on your phone, and like, that's, <laughs> that's all that happens. That's it. That's and all so it is. It's like, oh, cool. Uh, I guess we're I'm watch go back to Stranger Things now. Uh, so, but it's no, it's absolutely incredible, and like we wouldn't be here without you guys. So it just it genuinely means so much. Thank you guys so much. All right, so your story, yes, for sure, your story really is fascinating, and we're going to get to a lot of it. We're going to go back to the beginning, but I mean, we were talking a little bit backstage and talking about you know you're a New Yorker, you live downtown. Um, take me through a day for Taylor Momsen. What's like what's like a normal day if you're not rehearsing and you're just chilling you wake up and what happens uh well i wake up in the afternoon oh i love that I'm so <laughs> that's jealous. my morning um i'm very much a night owl mornings are not my friend um <clears throat> i mean i don't know i'm pretty boring if i'm being honest uh i have a little dog so i hang out with her mostly I get coffee that's you can't function without coffee are you a breakfast person or no you're one of those who no, needs to I'm wait a, until i'm a coffee person. Okay. I don't really, I'm not a breakfast person. Okay. Um, I do love breakfast for dinner though. That's one of my favorite things <sighs> ever. Too. And New York is great because you got 24 hour diners. <laughs> you really do. When you go on tour, it's strangely, you can never, I never eat eggs on tour because I don't wake up in the morning and then everywhere else you go, there's no eggs after like noon. So <laughs> no breakfast for me on tour. Um, but uh, no, I wake up, I get coffee, um, walk around, walking in the city is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I love people watching, yeah. I work out. Watch TV, play guitar, hang Are out. you really watching Stranger Things right I now? I really am watching Stranger Things so right good. now. <laughs> so excited um, for the next I one. I think it's really great, actually. It's yeah, amazing. It's, it's I, amazing. I missed it early on, and everyone kept saying it was amazing, and I ran out of other television, so I started it, and it's, it's quite entertaining. When you're binging, because there is so much, obviously, just coming out of the pandemic, or slowly coming out of the pandemic, yes. when you're binging something, something like really like connecting with a television show, do you ever go, what if I never stopped? What if I never stopped doing the whole TV thing? Oh, no. No, that never happens. Oh, no, no, that no. That thought I, never crosses oh, your no, mind. Oh, no, God, no. Okay. Um, especially because it's, it's impossible for me to watch, you know, films or anything. Like, if I know you personally, I suddenly, I can't watch it. I can't take it seriously. Right. Um, it's, it completely changes it. Because uh, it's like, oh, that's my friend. Oh, you're playing a serial killer now? Okay. Um, like, so it's just, <laughs> so, I, and I really enjoy film and, and television. So, I, I like the mystery. I like, I want to be okay. on the other side of the curtain. I don't want to be behind that curtain anymore. Well, you've toured with some amazing bands. Um, just uh, unbelievable. And you're going to be touring with even more this summer and this fall. It's really, really awesome. And I know you did some touring with Shinedown. Are you still with Shinedown right now? No, we finished that a month ago. Okay. A month ago? So I loved that you shared the story with Brent Smith from Shinedown um, uh, about how one of the songs that made him fall in love with your band, The Pretty Reckless, mm -hmm. you lost after you had recorded in Hurricane Sandy. Is that correct? Uh, not just that song. We lost everything we'd recorded for the album. It was, f it was for the record going to hell. And uh, we were recording at a studio in Hoboken, New Jersey, um, where we actually recorded a lot of, well, I guess, timelines, Taylor. Going to hell was our second album, Light Me Up. We recorded some of that there as well. Um, and we were in the process of making Going to Hell, and Hurricane Sandy came in and wiped out the entire place. Um, we lost everything. It was quite devastating at the time. Uh, but, you know, songs are songs, recordings, you can re-record them, and so that's what we did. We packed up, moved to another place while that was under renovation, and then ended up finishing it back at Water Music uh, yeah. later. But it was, uh, yeah, when months of work just goes literally down the drain, it was <laughs> it was not ideal, to say the least. <laughs> We're super excited about that. I no. mean, that's obviously very heartbreaking. But like, what's your process when you do go into the studio? I mean, it, was there something to that? Did it force you to look at the songs you had recorded and lost in a different way? Maybe change them? I mean, was there um, a silver lining at all? 
Well, the silver lining was I didn't have all the songs for the album yet, but uh, Going to Hell was actually written in during the blackout in Manhattan okay. in my Lower East Side apartment. Uh, I had 12 candles. I'd been waiting to burn them, bitches. <laughs> Cat William joke. Perfect time. Uh, it was perfect timing, <laughs> too. I actually had 12 candles, and I thought that was quite funny. Uh, and, yeah, and that's where that song, not that that was about the hurricane by any means, but that's kind of, you know, interesting cir circumstances influence your mind and they influence writing and you never really know where a song is going to come from or when or what's going to impact that and those circumstances going to hell was birthed so we got the title track out of it there's something there you go <laughs> so when you do write a song and you go and you record it how long will you sit on it or go back and change things or re-record parts until it's done like how long does it take you i'm i'm sure it's different with each song or it each is. album but I mean, usually, are you a perfectionist and you keep going back in and you want to do a line differently? Or I'm a perfectionist. Of course, I'm a perfectionist. Um, I'm, but I'm, I'm very meticulous. So change. I don't. I don't think I. I. You sit. First of all, you sit with everything for a long time. Yeah. Like by the time you guys hear a record, it's been tested and tested again. It's like old. And I've, I've gotten sick of it and then <laughs> re fell in love with it and it's gone through the the the, the, the ringer. Um, but as far as you know, recording and each it's difficult because each song's different. Um, nothing gets put down, nothing gets recorded if it's uh, if it already hasn't been through the first stages of testing of is this a quality enough song yeah. to record? And then the recording process is it it's kind of an evolution of how do I you hear this thing in your head and then it's the the challenge it's like a puzzle is trying to figure out how to make what you hear in your head physically come out of the other end of the speaker so everyone else can hear it too and so it's kind of this puzzle piece that that sometimes happens really organically and quickly and sometimes is a struggle and can take months you know or years or whatever but when it's finished there's a very definitive, I almost call them definitive recordings. Like mm -hmm. that's what the album version is. And then we have different renditions of songs like Going to Hell, which we just did is kind of a, you know the acoustic version of that song. But uh, the definitive recording is the album version. And when that's finished, everyone kind of knows that. That's the kind of an immediate like, all right, well, we did it. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Yeah. Next one. And little mixes and mix changes and things like that go back and forth for a while. But um but in general, like you know when it's you know when it's good. You can you can feel it. You get it. Yeah. It's a vibe. Yeah, it's, it's a, vibe. a vibe. So you have gone through a good amount of ups and downs, roller coasters, heartbreak, um, and amazing accomplishments over your life and your career. But I want to take it all the way back to the beginning. You were born in um, St. Louis, Missouri. I was. And it seems like you were put in front of a camera at a very very young age. I was. Two. Two, yeah. Could you could just walk then, and they were like, ta-da! Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Um, no, I got put into modeling when I was two, and I guess I was. So the story goes. Who knows if any of this is it's true? It's been changed probably fourteen but, uh, times. <laughs> exactly. Well, so the story goes. I was very chatty as a child, which I find funny in retrospect because I tend to be kind of a shy adult. I'm very introverted most of the time. Um, but as a kid, I guess I was very talkative. And my modeling agent said to my mother, you know, she should go on auditions. She never shuts up. And, I, <laughs> and that's how that happened. And so I got sent over to an acting agent and uh, went on my, f they sent me on like a trial run for my first audition, which was Shake and bake, and I, Which I booked happen to that, love, by the way. Was, so my first, thank you. My so my first audition booked my first quote unquote role, and that's where it all started. And do you think? I mean, obviously, every child or person that is put into acting or put in front of a camera to sing or dance or act or do whatever at a young age, I feel like that begins to shape who they are and affect them differently. How would you sure. say that it, it, it did it for you? Was it, a, would you look back on it as like a positive thing or maybe it was too much too soon? Um, I think I handled it well, but I think that that's, be I think that I'm very fortunate in the way that I, I fell in love with something outside of myself at a very young age yeah. and that, that gift, that's something being music and that gift gave me purpose, I mm -hmm. guess, and it gave me a, a, I saw a future, I saw where I wanted my life to go, I saw a trajectory that I wanted to follow, yeah. and so I was, you know, even though I was working a lot and doing different kinds of jobs and things, um, I had something else, I had another goal in mind, so it was always this kind of thing that I did, you know, some kids went to school and had lots of friends, I traveled a lot and worked a lot, didn't have a ton of friends, because I was never really in one place too long, that's why I said I was very introverted. And mm -hmm. that's where music kind of became this 
companion of mine where, you know, my records that I listened to became my best friends. And like suddenly the musicians that I list listened to were my family and like mm -hmm. I understood them and they understood me. And it's, you know, that that connection that you get with artists um, when you truly love music. And that led to writing to me, which is I started writing songs when I was very young. Not good ones, mind you, but <laughs> <laughs> but, well, songs <laughs> but songs nonetheless. And um, and that's I found that that was kind of the place where I could really be myself and express myself with no influence from the outside world. And that was a very freeing feeling. And I just I figured that out really young. And so just as I got older, I just continued to work at that and develop that and. Um, now here I am. Right. So yeah. So I think for me it was positive. I mean, I, I certainly there's negative aspects, of course, to yeah. anything like lack of friends or lack of certain kinds of stability and stuff. But um, I look at all of my childhood as kind of like the the things I learned from it, and probably the the most important thing I learned and, and that I still use to this day is that it really instilled a very um, very strong work ethic yeah. in me, which I I would go I, I go when I'm on I don't stop and I, it's sometimes detrimental to my health <laughs> but uh but in general I think that that's a good thing to have and uh, you know some some gen some people I know in this generation don't have that and so I think that that's something that I'm very fortunate to have because it it taught me well for adult life yeah yeah I mean it's definitely difficult to go through you know, um, uh, puberty and going through like all the all those difficult times when you're like what are 12, 13, mm -hmm. and to do any of that in front of the world, you know, go through that kind of awkward time when you like hate everyone and everything's just like, I, was it that? I, have I passed that phase? <laughs> uh. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> but I mean, did was it much more difficult because some of that time, some of that development was happening in front of the world? I don't think I really saw it like that. I mean, I, th I think that for me, you know, my teen, my early teenage, first of all, I started the band when I was 14, just turning 15. Like we recorded the first album when I was 15 years old. It came out when I was 17, but uh, I'm only 15, 16 vocally on the, on the wow. first album. So I kind of, we had formed this unit and so my, my uh, I, I had, again, I had this thing outside of my, technical career that was kind of keeping me stable and keeping me together and driving me. Um, so as far as like, you know, getting, d developing or whatever in front of the public eye, there was, I think the thing that bothered me the most is that I had this very strong identity as myself and the way the tabloids worked and the way the paparazzi worked and the, the public the internet, all of that. I would get photographed as my character, you know, yeah. in costume on set, and that would be put into tabloids as me wearing something ridiculous, and <laughs> you, you know, on set that was not Taylor. And so, like Taylor's wearing this, blah blah blah, and that's like on a very shallow note of of fashion. But in general, like I felt like the public persona mm -hmm. and the public image of me was very incorrect to who I was, and so that became very frustrating. That I had this whole other not even other, this, this whole side to me that no one, like who I yeah. am that no one knew. And so that that kind of crisis of identity of everyone knew me as Jenny and I'm coming into my own as an adult and a teenager going, no, I'm Taylor, like it's yeah. a character, guys, it's yeah. a character. So I think that was frustrating to me, but um, but also I didn't really think about it that much, okay. if I'm being honest, I just kind of focused on what I was yeah. doing and, and yeah, did that. What's your relationship <laughs> with, you know, paparazzi, photographers, media, social media now? It's certainly evolved over the years. Right. Um, you know, as everything's progressed. I mean, when this all started, it was paparazzi. And, you know, there wasn't Instagram or Twitter or any of that yet. So <laughs> it's yeah. crazy to even think about because we all live our lives by it now. Um, it was sort of a lovely time then, right? It was. I kind of miss it. I do, uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was... Uh, you know, back in the day, back in the day, um, paparazzi was kind of, I figured out how to like, you know, you make friends with them. So then they respect you a little bit. And now you go, don't take a picture of me yet. Let me like get my jacket on first or, you yeah. know, that type of thing. Um, so I figured that because there's, it's New York. It's a big city, but it's a small city. You eventually have met everyone <laughs> or no one. Um, <laughs> so you'd see the same faces and you go, hey, Justin, give me a second. <laughs> um, so that was fine. But uh, and then with social media, I, I still am trying to figure it out. I still don't 
have it down by any means. Um, I don't know that there's a right way or a yeah, wrong I don't way think to you're do it. To. Yeah. But it's a fine line to me of you know sharing enough with everyone that you understand where I'm coming from, how I'm thinking, and you know because all of that kind of uh, information that I divulge to you guys or whatever or share is is a is a way a, a deeper way for you guys to understand the music and understand how I think you know all of those things which I think is awesome and it's just entertaining it's, you know it's, yeah. it's fun to look at do you know what people are doing it's I mean like you fall into <laughs> an Instagram hole or two oh, once in a while of course it's the you know the stalking people oh god <laughs> so fun uh, <laughs> so fun it's you know it's, it's reality TV all the time um, but it's a fine line for me of how much you know because I still am a very private person and yeah. so I, I try to keep my private life very private and then but at the same time still share as much as I feel comfortable with and I feel like I'm always kind of writing that line and, and teetering it and I'm trying to get more comfortable with yeah. sharing more I yeah. guess because Everyone always wants more. Yep. You know, and they're <laughs> never, they're insatiable, and that's never going to end. So you, yeah. you're, I think you've done a very amazing job yeah. and continue to do an amazing job. Thanks. You know, trying to find that balance, which is not easy. The cool thing that I do love about social media, though, is the connection that you get to have with the fans. Mm -hmm. That direct, immediate response and communication that yeah. you know past generations didn't have at all, and uh, that's very cool to hear people's stories to see what they're thinking you know, you know votes and see who's coming to what show and like you know there's I don't know every face in the crowd but I certainly do now like I know yeah. more than I did 10 years ago yeah. because I see their picture all the time and I think that that's that's a very cool element it becomes like part of your family I'm sure yeah 100% do you look back on your TV times fondly and are you do you still in touch with people that you've worked with on TV do you follow their careers are they following yours are you I mean yeah I mean I still have friends some <laughs> I mean I've got some friends. friends but I mean <laughs> the people that you've worked with on Gossip Girl or anywhere else? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Gossip Girl, I'm, I'm still very good close with uh, Connor, who played Eric. He's a dear friend of mine. Um, and Michelle Trattenberg's a good friend. Uh, you know, and then honestly, my friends on that show were a lot of them were worked on the show, behind the scenes people who oh, cool. I stay in touch with. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, the the cat Kelly Rutherford is very sweet. She always tries to make it out to shows. Um, so I mean, yeah, I still see what people are doing. There's the internet; you can't not see it. Right. Um, but I think that you know we've all kind of grown apart and done our own thing, yeah. except for those very close bonds. Like Connor's, Connor was in my corner from day one, and I love so it. we had a a nice thing going. And I love it. I miss that. I miss that dude. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you feel really strongly that while you were on television, that you were always like this passion continued to grow, that you were meant to be in music, and that, you know, obviously you started the band much younger than I think I even thought that you did. Do you remember the day that you were like, I, I, it's music, it's not, or, or was it like a slow evolution? Was it, was there like a slow realization, or was it one day that you were like, I'm done, I don't want to do this anymore, music's my passion? Well, I always knew that. I always knew music was my passion. I just didn't know that I didn't have to also act. Okay. <laughs> Because I started as a kid, yeah. so it was something that I just did, and I didn't know that that was a choice. And so I think when I, it was probably around 16, mm -hmm. um, it suddenly just, I don't remember exactly what happened, but some tumultuous something, I'm sure, and uh, something clicked in my brain, and it just went, oh, wait, wait a second. I don't have to do this? I mean, I can not come to work every day and do this job. I can just make records. Sign me up. I can just go on tour with a band, with a rock band, and play music, and that's all. I Hold on. <laughs> no one told me this. And and that's that's where it changed. And, and, you know, don't get me wrong, that was a... So when that clicked, that was just, that was it for me. But um, it was, you know, very challenging to make that a reality because it's not as simple as just, well, I'm not coming to work today. You know, there's contracts and you know, thousands of people involved. Of and course. It's, it's, so that was a bit uh, complicated, to say the least. But it all worked out in the end. It <laughs> did. I mean, who would you say was the most supportive? Like, who, like, uh, assisted in you, would you say, the most to make that come to fruition, to make that a reality, to end the acting well, and really get you on stage? A couple people, I think, I mean, the first thing at the... There's two directions to go here. The first thing is I'll, I'll shout out uh, Stephanie Savage and Josh Schwartz, the, the writers of Gossip Girl and the creators of Gossip Girl. They were very supportive of an understanding of where I was coming from and what I wanted to do. And we had, the, basically when I asked to leave the show, they said, you can't. 
you're under contract. Um, you're one of the main characters. Uh, no way. You signed right um, here. You know, the, <laughs> the, the head of CW was like, <laughs> she's not leaving. Um, and I was very upset with that. And to make a very long story short, I spoke to Stephanie and Josh in depth about how I was feeling and where I was at. And they were like, well, we can't let you out of your contract because that's beyond our ability. But what we can do is we can write you slowly out of the show so that you are have the time to do what you need to do. Wow. And so that was really amazing because I wouldn't have been able to go on my first tour and support our record and, and do any of the things that I'm able to do now had they forced me to stay on the show. And instead yeah. they were very gracious and very understanding that I was so young. I was at a transitory place in my life and they saw I think they 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 saw the the genuine like need that I I was very unhappy where I was and I needed to move on from that it was it had been a great experience up until then like I have no hard feelings towards it but it was it was time for me to go time. and I think that's and that's a s huge story that gets twisted a lot of I was fired or whatever right. I was like no no I begged you stormed <laughs> off <laughs> I, be yeah. I begged on hands and knees <laughs> and you know yeah. whatever I could do and so I'm just I'm very thankful to them for that because I wouldn't be here had they made a different decision. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of things, you know, honestly, meeting Cato, um, our producer, and, and meeting Ben, who was just here, mm -hmm. um, I met them at the same time, and that was that was a, a meeting of minds that was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. And I think, you know, they would, well, Cato's no longer with us, uh -huh. and Ben's no longer in this room, but I think they would have both attest that it was similar for them as well, where it was just, it's rare to meet it's rare to meet people that you genuinely connect with on every level, like where it's just you feel like you've known them your entire life. There's uh, you feel like a hole that was in you is now filled up. Like it's just this crazy um, otherworldly thing. And so when that happened, because I always knew I wanted to be in a band and and not a band where like you audition a bunch of players and you find someone that like can do yeah. the job and right. like kind of has a look. like it wasn't about that it wasn't about image it wasn't about that I wanted that genuine connection that genuine band feel of like I want to create my own family and do this together and that's a hard thing to find I mean ask any band um, <laughs> so so it was just was one of those magic lucky as hell yeah. moments where it just all kind of clicked and it all worked and Ben was playing in a band with Mark and Jamie at the time um, and I loved what they were doing. I had recorded a bunch of demos. He loved what I was doing and it was just kind of one of those like, hey, what if, uh, what if I become the singer of your band and we change the name? Cool. We like it. Cool. We like it. Okay. <laughs> and so that's how the Pretty Reckless was formed. And and Kato was kind of the fifth member, um, you know, behind the scenes where he, you know, produced all the albums and was kind of the, uh, you know, very integral in everything we did. And um, and that and that stability and that formation really gave me the, the I don't want to, courage is almost the wrong word, but uh, it gave me the that extra little p the push that I really needed to go. Okay, I'm making the right decision in leaving this lack of a better term, kind of massive career <laughs> and <laughs> leaving that behind and going to pursue something that might not be successful. And that, um, because it would just, it, there was no question to me at that point. Right. It was just, I had blinders on and it was go. Was it always rock? Was mm -hmm. it always going to be rock? Like, who did you listen to? Who did you listen to? Who do you listen to? Who do you love? Well, my taste has not changed that much. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, first band I ever heard was the Beatles. Um, my dad's a huge rock and roll fan, so I grew up listening to his vinyl collection. Um, thankfully, he, he would make me mixtapes and things of just, you know, the thanks greats. Dad. So, thanks, Dad. Wherever you are. Um, you know, the Beatles and uh, Led Zeppelin and The Who and yeah. Pink Floyd and ACDC and Bob Dylan and Neil Young and Queen and okay. All the, good uh, stuff. the Doors and Jimi <laughs> Hendrix and, you know, I keep listing artists. Um, and then when I got a little older, older <laughs> I started to discover... Uh, <laughs> I started to discover some things on my own. Like I got really into the '90s music scene, you so know, obviously I. with Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden. Mm -hmm. And Soundgarden was the second. The Beatles was the first band that made me fall in love with music and wanted to write songs and uh, tell stories through music. And Soundgarden was the second band that really influenced my life. Um, and so I, I put those two bands as the kind of pinnacle, like the pillars of my of my musical, there's a billion bands in between that are, and artists that are phenomenal, but those two were the two moments that I, that really arced um, who I became and who I've become. Yeah.
Yeah, you can clap. Okay? <laughs> clap if it feels good. <laughs> um, when I heard Soundgarden, my I mind, mean, when it clicks, like, I don't know if anyone here is a Soundgarden yeah. fan. Soundgarden yeah. fans, anyone? Yeah, yeah. All right. Me. But, like, when you, when it, Soundgarden is one of those amazing bands, kind of like the Beatles, that when it clicks yes. with you, and when you suddenly, when it. you understand it, because it's, you might not get it at first, but when it, when it, that little something happens, you go, oh my God, I, this is the most amazing thing yep. I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. And it's never going to get old, and there's so many layers, and there's so much depth, and it's so smart and so intricate, and it's just, and to this day, you know, I can listen to those records at nauseum, and no matter, every time I put on a Soundgarden record, um, I hear something new. And that's, that's the kind of music that I really love, is that it never, you never reach the bottom of it. It's, yeah. it's always giving you something. Yeah. One of my favorite covers ever, because I work at Sirius XM, is Chris Cornell at, um, mm -hmm. in our fishbowl, performing Nothing Compares, and now it's become one of the most, I don't know, viewed uh, covers oh, yeah. on the internet, but yeah. I mean, I will listen to that at least once a week. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. legendary. Well, and you know, one of the most phenomenal voices yes. in music history. So, You're right. Yeah, but yeah. So <laughs> you feel this way about Soundgarden? You get this chance to to go on tour with them. Do you remember where you were when you found? Oh, we're out? fast forwarding now. Okay. We're fast forwarding a little um, bit. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna go back and forth in time. Um, I mean, but you find out that you're you're gonna get a chance to to work with basically this this group that you bow down to what what were you feeling i was in shock <laughs> um i mean we've gotten you know every time you you get a tour or whatever it goes through the rounds of agents and you know all the business sides of it and there's tours you're up for and tours that just kind of fall into place and are easy pairings and whatever and when i got the phone call that we were going to open for soundgarden First of all, my agent on the other line, like everyone in my camp was on the other end of the phone because they knew that was a big one. They were like, oh, she's going to she's gonna lose it. I want to <laughs> be on the call for this one. Um, and it was just, I, my jaw dropped, and I, I thought they were playing a joke at first. And then when I realized it was true, it was, it was just the coolest feeling in the world um, and such a highlight of my career and my life. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it any better than that. I mean, I feel like, you know, you go on tour with Guns N' Roses, which mm -hmm. you got a chance to which do. Which is and also amazing, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, this girl is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and, and then to have that and then get that call, it's just got to, you just have to pinch yourself at that point. You're certainly pinching yourself. Um, and I had something to say. That's and okay. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I mean, we're talking Guns N' Roses and Soundgarden here. I understand. Well, yeah, I mean, and Guns N' Roses was at the very beginning of our career. Funny, mm -hmm. just side note popped into my head. Funny thing about Guns N' Roses was, that was the first, uh, it was only on the first record, so we only had Light Me Up out. And, you know, Axel's a very specific kind of person and a phenomenal singer, but he does things his own way. His own and this way. is a very public knowledge of Axl Rose. And, uh, you know, we're on <laughs> tour, and normally <laughs> when you go on a tour and you're an opening band or on a festival stage or anything, you have a very specific time slot, and you cannot go over that time slot. You get in a lot of trouble. And so you have to be off at a certain time. And with Guns N' Roses, it was the exact opposite. We played the first show with them. We got off on our time, and the stage manager comes up and goes, we need you to play longer. Oh, gosh. And we go, well, okay, I guess we can add a, a cover. Okay. <laughs> next next night, we need you to play longer. Well, okay, we're, it got to the point where we, went, we were playing the entire album. We're like, we're playing everything we have. Three taking requests? Three covers, <laughs> and Ben's extending all the guitar solos. Like, this is all we got right now, guys. Like, I'm sorry. And someone's <laughs> on the corner of the stage, like, stretch. Um, so that was, just, that was just a funny little side note to that tour that I'll never forget, where it's the, the one and only tour where you were asked to never leave the stage. <laughs> But I mean, and amazing. I mean, and Axel was just ridiculous. Yeah. Like it's so good, so and great to Axel, watch them every night. If he needs you to go longer, you go longer. You go longer. You figure it out. And you know what? When you're that great, if you want to go on, you go on when you feel it, man. <laughs> I don't want to watch you at, not at your best. Yeah. Like I want to watch you when you want to be on that stage. That's the best time to be in the audience. Agreed. So you go on tour. Obviously, we're fast forwarding again. You get this call and you're you go on tour with Soundgarden. Did you get like how long until you got a chance to like hang out with them and maybe you know chill backstage or sing together or just get to know each other? Um, well, we played with we played one show with Soundgarden before this tour a few years prior, um, which was awesome. It was a festival in Quebec City. It was like ninety thousand people, um, and we were on the day with Soundgarden, and I, I think it was just 
I, want, I could be wrong about this, but maybe I just beelined it for Soundgarden, so I had blinders on, but I think <laughs> it was just us and them, and maybe there was one band before us. Okay. Um, but that was the first time I got to see them, because they had just reformed, um, which is amazing. And uh, I met Ben Shepard backstage mm -hmm. there, and he was very cool. Um, it's the first time... No, oh, this is actually not true either, but I'm about to say something wrong. Uh, it was one of the, one of, I'd met Chris previously a few years back at an event called Fashion Rocks, um, but I saw him on the side. So that was like a quick passing okay. at the, at this festival, which was awesome. And I figured that would be like one and done, that's it. Um, and then a few years later, we got the call to open for them. And that kind of, I think we, is, you know, the quick high hellos in the first few days, and then it was probably like the third or fourth show in that we had all our dressing rooms were, well, tours are very chaotic. So the beginning, everyone's, every camp is trying to get rolling and like doing right. their own thing and until you get a, into a flow. And so everyone's kind of living in their own worlds. And, um, but once all that settled and we kind of found a groove, yeah. the tour had found a groove and we, our dressing rooms were very close and it was kind of just, I don't know, like we just started chatting and it was, it was very, easy, very cool, and the best, I was so nervous, and the best thing about it was that they were awesome, yeah. is that, like, you know, you always hear, don't meet your idols, yep. don't meet people yep. you admire, it can go really south, it can taint your perception yep. of them, it can change how you see the music, how you hear it, and I really didn't want that, so, like, at the Quebec show, I saw Chris Cornell, and I, like, ran the other way, because I was like, I don't want to <laughs> get to know this guy, it's going to mess it up, and, uh, and then on this tour, we obviously... <laughs> formed a relationship and it was great and that that's the thing is that it was so genuine and they were so down to earth and so just phenomenal in every aspect and it was that was such a so relieving yeah. <laughs> um and you know and and they've become very dear friends of mine at this point so it's uh amazing so unfortunately as everybody knows he, you know he his life did end in tragedy while on that tour i believe it was the final night correct it was yes um <coughs> Tell us a little bit about, you know, now that he's gone, like what having had that experience meant to you, that you got to be a part of his journey and his story too, um, and having been with him and, and then lost him and having him have been a part of your life and losing him. I mean, what did that mean to you? Well, that's a huge question. It is. I don't know Take that your I, time. I don't know that I have a good answer to that because, first of all, having having him and having them be in my life at all ever was is amazing um and i you know obviously will, i'll never take that for granted i don't think i'm over i don't think there's ever a good like oh, i'm cool with it now like it's not it's no. not cool it's, it's terrible it's tragic and you know the fact that there's n not going to be more music and that that was the end of something so amazing is, is still hard to wrap my mind around um you know, even forget all the personal side of things, just as a fan, um, the not hearing anything new again is very, very sad. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I've thought, you know, it's been years, but I still don't know that I've reflected on it in a way that I have a simple answer to that of just like, this is how I feel about it now. Cause yeah. I think it changes, you know, monthly, yearly, daily, um, minutely, you know, so it's, it's, I don't think it's like that. I, I think that I'm, I'm very glad that, you know, to put a positive spin on everything that out of all that tragedy, I did form some very meaningful relationships mm -hmm. with the rest of the band that created some, you know, very important music um, to me and to them. And, you know, with the, uh, starting with the song Only Love Can Save Me Now. And so I think that, you know, it's, we took tragedy as best we could and tried to turn it into something beautiful. But I, but it's... It never really gets no, easier. So. No. And they helped write Only Love Can See Me Now? No. Or they were part of it? They were, they, they, I, <coughs> I wrote Only Love Can Save Me Now. I was in Maine on a boat, actually, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and wrote that song. And, and as soon as that was completed uh, musically and lyrically, I just couldn't hear it without them, without yeah. their, they have a very, you know, Matt Cameron, Kim Thale, they have a very distinct unlike anyone else on the planet sound uh, yeah. individually and then especially together. And um, I just thought that they would add so much weight and importance to this, this song that was very important to me. So I sent them a demo of it um, and called them up and said, hey guys, <laughs> wanna, wanna play on this thing? And, uh, <laughs> and they say, you know, they thankfully said yes. And it was, that was actually a very wonderful experience. We 
flew to Seattle because um, yeah. it was very important to me that we did it. And A, I wanted them to be s as comfortable as possible because I didn't want to taint their greatness in any sort of way. <laughs> I just <laughs> want them to do their thing. Um, but also just, you know, getting to record in Seattle's awesome. I love traveling to studios and it's yeah. super cool. There's history. So we did it at London Bridge, uh, London Bridge Studios, which is, you know, where uh, Pearl Jam made 10, Alice in Chains made Dirt, Soundgarden made Louder Than Love. So and it was the first time they were back in that studio since they had made Louder Than Love. So it was just very cool to be in a studio with so much history with these two iconic players, uh, musicians, and now friends of mine making something new together after so much kind of pain and hardship that we'd all been to been through together and separately um it was just a very beautiful moment and and just very cool because like they recorded there you know years ago and just yeah. london bridge is one of those kind of grungy grimy studios my very much my vibe i don't I, it's my dream to rec I'm switching topics. Okay. <laughs> I, would just, I would I dream of recording at Abbey Road, but I'm a little nervous that it's too clean <laughs> for you. I get for that. For me, like I, I I like studios that have a little bit of grit to them, like where I don't feel like I have to wipe my feet when I walk in. Um, and London Bridge is very much that. <laughs> it, has a, it has a good vibe to it. And getting to walk around and looking at all the pictures and yeah. Polaroids and everything on the wall with with Kim just pointing out every person, going, "Oh, I know that guy, and this guy said this, and oh, this is a great story." It's just the whole thing was awesome yeah. yeah so after um chris passed away you guys took some time right mm -hmm. um how long did you take before you lost another friend before you lost kato it was uh i'd have to actually do math in my head it was it was too soon too quick not that there's ever yeah a, an appropriate amount of time but it was i was basically <coughs> um chris chris passed we continue, you know, we were in the middle of tour. Yeah. Um, and so that news was obviously extraordinarily shocking and crushing. And it didn't, I didn't know how to process that. And I was getting on stage, you know, we played a few shows after that. And I was just very not present and very not, um, certainly not at my best. I was <laughs> kind of destroyed inside. And it, it, it felt very, I, I quickly came to the realization that it was, um, not a good place for me to be at the moment on tour. Um, and it felt very unfair to the fans to get on stage and kind of fake my way through this set that I was not into. Into you? I just, I didn't want to, well, the answer me, and I, I just didn't want to be there. I needed, yeah. I needed to step back. Yeah. So I quickly kind of came to that real realization, um, canceled the rest of touring, um, which was not the best business decision. We were in the middle of a record cycle, but necessary. Went home to try to process, kind of wrap my head yeah. around everything. Um, and in order to kind of, you know, something that's always been a constant in my life is in times of strife or trouble, and also, and it's not always negative, also times of great happiness and things, but songwriting is, this, is the place where I go. Yeah. And so, I tried to turn to music to kind of get me out of this funk and, and process what I was feeling and what I was thinking and um, started to write some songs. And, and it wasn't just me that was, you know, crushed by this. Obviously, the entire world was, but also yeah. the band and, you know, Ben, ben and Cato and everyone was so down about yeah. this. And um, so we were talking to each other going, we need to, we need to get out of this funk. We need yeah. to do something. I was like, I got some songs. I don't know what they're for. I don't know if they're for a record, but like I've written some stuff. Let's just get into a studio Why because not? maybe because making something always makes you feel good. Yeah. At least I feel like so many. At least most of the time, <laughs> sometimes it makes you feel awful, yeah. but most of the time it makes you feel better. At least yeah. like you're doing something and um, and can help put things into perspective. And so we started. We were just starting to book studio time, and then I got the phone call that Cato died in a in a motorcycle accident, and that. I can't imagine. Is the, is the I s keep repeating phrases in interviews because I don't really know how to say That's it okay. any other way, but it, it was the nail in the coffin for me where yeah. I was not okay from, from Chris's passing and I was trying to kind of force myself out of that grief. And then Cato passing was just, I went downwards. I, I essentially quit life. Like I, I feel very deeply into this very dark hole of depression and substance abuse and you know, everything that comes with with loss and trauma and because it's traumatic and um and I wasn't 
equipped to handle it. I did not handle it well. <laughs> um, and so that was a very, I don't even remember what your it's question okay. was. You were speaking very <laughs> eloquently um, about something very difficult. So it was a very trying time, to say the least. So, it, oh, your question was how far apart. The, too soon. Uh, yeah. Still kind of trying to get out of the, the got hole. Hit when and then down. got hit when I was down, and that just... I mean, took me to the bottom because Cato was, like you said, you know, he was there at the, at the beginning of the pre-reckless mm -hmm. and was such an integral part of your life and your career. I mean, obviously you were in a dark place, but do you, but do you look back and there was maybe a time when you thought you would never come back to music? Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. I, not just music. It was anything. Yeah. Um, I think that was, you know, I, I kind of sunk. I don't know. I, I've. I fell so off course. I fell so, I fell so down in so many ways that I just I didn't see a way out of it. And I think probably the scariest part about it was that I became very comfortable there. I was very yeah. content with essentially just kind of fading into nothing. Like I just looked around at the world and went, I don't see the point of anything. Everything I love is dead. I quit. Yeah. Um, I you know, and that doesn't mean like I quit music. It's like no. I quit everything. And, you know, it took a very long time and a lot of work to kind of try to climb out of that hole. And, and I think that's the thing to remember with grief in general or, or any kind of, you know, horrible experience in life is that it, y it's Im it seems impossible when you're there, like yeah. with depression or whatever. Like it just seems like you'll never find your way out. And um, I certainly didn't think I would. And it... And it and the, the thing to remember, my point is the thing to remember, which I'm now saying a lot because I think it's important to hear, is it does get better. And I hated that phrase. If yeah. someone told me that, I just wanted to punch them right in the face. Um, <laughs> <'cause> it <laughs> and But it, it does. Um, things do get better. Life does continue. And, you know, those wounds will, with time, eventually turn into scars. You know, they never go away. They're forever with me. Um, you know they're they're a part of my being now, but but they're not quite, they're not they're not bleeding all over the right. floor anymore. Right, <laughs> right. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and there's people who love you no matter what you think at that mm -hmm. time, and the world needs you no matter what you think at mm -hmm. that time, and I think that that's important to remember. Definitely. So, you know, let's fast forward to, yeah. <laughs> to Death by Rock and Roll, which, I mean, we like outrises the phoenix. I mean, it just it's it's. Unbelievable, the record is incredible. I'm obsessed with it. Thank you. And again, you kind of get hit because you make this record and then the apocalypse happens and we have a pandemic. <laughs> yes, yes, it's good times, yeah. good times. So, I, I mean, what were your thoughts? Were you scared? Were you like, okay, I have to shelf this? Were you like, maybe people need this in this pandemic? I mean, where I feel like so many artists that I spoke to during this time, right at the beginning of the pandemic, during it and now after, had different views. Some people were like, you know what, Th this is not the time for it. And some people were like, this is what the world needs, is my music right now. Well, I think I have to backtrack to answer that a little bit. B put simply, um, and nothing is simple about music or art, but put simply, making Death by Rock and Roll saved my life. Um, you know, writing it, recording it, 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 it was created at my lowest and kind of unbeknownst to me, it, it, it has an arc to it that is, in fact, looking back on it and reflecting on it after it was completed and I could listen to it um, almost from an outside perspective from the first time, it has this arc that is actually quite hopeful. Um, it start and musically that you know the track listing was very important with that as well because it tells the story in this kind of full circle way where it's it starts off very bleak and very heavy. Um, you know, and it's still rock and roll, so it's still fun, but like yeah. you know, lyrically and whatever, it's very dark and heavy and almost ominous. And then about halfway through the record, there's this musical shift where things start to get a little lighter and a little um, a little more optimistic. You know, not, not fully optimistic, <laughs> but a little more. Um, can go all the way. A little bit. And I think <laughs> that and it kind of it has this arc to it. And I suddenly, it occurred to me that like it, it was this very hopeful album. And so when I realized that, having the pandemic happen and everyone was in this very low spot and very confused, um, myself <laughs> included, obviously, yeah. um, it's, it was scary because it was this very important piece of work that I had slaved over and I didn't want to just, you know, the fear of putting it out and in, in the midst of all this chaos and having it get lost yeah. or, you know, disappear in today's ether and not have it um, 
be received at the right time because you know music it, music is special that way where it, it, when you hear it like you can hear a song and you go I don't like it and then you know th three months later you're in a different you've changed as a person and you hear yeah. it and you go this connects to me so much and so I was very nervous of it getting lost because everyone you know the populace's mind was so scattered and so focused on everything that was happening so that was a huge concern of mine so we we ended up pushing the album release a little bit right but at the same time I this music saved my life and I feel like maybe that could help some other people and what am I going to do? Just hold on to this forever until the mm. world writes itself. The world never writes itself. Yeah. Um, you know, things, things go up and down, but there's always something happening that's awful. So, so we, we finally got to a place where it was like, okay, let's, let's put this, we put, so, excuse me, sorry. So we, we put out the single death by rock and roll. I was like, let's start there. Let's start with one song. <laughs> Baby steps. <laughs> Baby steps. Kind of been my motto for the past five years. Baby <laughs> steps. Um, so we put out the first single. It did very well. It went to number one on the rock charts, which is Obviously. awesome. Obviously. Uh, Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> which is Ext I'm extremely proud of and extremely thankful. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, that that song, op the first thing you hear on the album Death by Rock and Roll, the first thing you hear on the song are Cato's footsteps. So that memorializing him and making his legacy continue to live on, you know, even though he's no longer physically here, was so important to me. And the fact that that song did so tremendously well, it's like, what better way to mm. possibly honor this man's life um and so that was incredibly special to me so thank you guys um so there's that yeah. and then you know and then we put out a few other singles and we just kind of test in the waters a little yeah. bit and eventually i got to a place where i was you know i wrote and recorded this record when i was 24 turning 25 and i was now 27 it's like okay there's a song on this album <laughs> called 25 <laughs> what am i gonna put this out when i'm 30 like we've hit that <laughs> we've hit that point yeah um, and so we kind of, you know, bit the bullet and put it out and went, I hope everyone likes it. And hopefully this can bring some solace and some, you know, hope and, and something to something that, you know, people might be looking for right now. And I hope yeah. that I hope that it did that. So that's there's that. And then now yeah. we can finally tour because we never knew when that was going to happen. And right? that was that was kind of the weirdest thing about putting out an album was doing like press junkets from my house and, you know, pajama bottoms and <laughs> and uh, sitting that's on the couch. Fun, though. You kind of liked that. Well, in I did. one way, but like, you know, press is kind of the, the necessary evil. It's it's the it's the job of the of, the, you know, the entertainment industry. And so having to do eight hours of that a day for a year without the catharsis of playing live became okay. very brutal. Okay, I get um, it. I get <laughs> so that. that became a bit, especially talking about such heavy subject matter at nauseam, yes. um, without the catharsis of loud amps and getting to, you know, get emote, it out, get it out was uh, a bit challenging on my psyche for <clears throat> towards the end of it. But in, but it, so that was just bizarre. And then and not being able to play was just very weird. And so it feels fantastic to finally be able to say, even though it's not over and everyone here is still wearing masks yeah. and we got to, you know, still be safe. We're getting there. And we're getting there. And, you know, we're leaving in three, four days or whatever it is to go on tour. And that feels awesome. What does, what looks different about this tour? Like, is there anything different, like on stage, different that you've ever done before? Is there like... Uh, different lights, different pyro? Is there, is there just something cool that you're excited for fans to see that you've never done before? Um, I mean, well, as far as like tricks up our sleeve like that, I <laughs> we've never really been that kind of band. We're, we're very much a, a jam band for lack, I mean, to a degree where like, you know, we don't play with tracks. There's no anything like, it's very audible. Like we just call out what we're feeling. And it, so I think that where I'm going with this is due to the pandemic and all the time off, we we got so bored. We finally spent like six months in rehearsal space together when there was finally like rapid tests and things. And we'd never really done that before, like a consistent six months, like might've been eight, but like a long time every day just hanging out and playing without a purpose. Um, you know, in the past we were rehearsing for a tour or for a record or working something out, not just for the hell of it, and that really kind of created this new element with us that has always been there, but it's now escalated and matured in this in this way of like the comfortability and when we get just got better yeah. and we're better. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the simple way. So in, in one way, we, we almost feel, at least to us, we feel like we're a whole new band and it's kind of wow. this rebirth, this breathe this new life into us, um, which is this blessing in disguise. So I, I think that that makes for 
a very entertaining show and okay. something very special. Um, and you know, and it's just it's loud live rock and roll, and it's always sad about that. It's always awesome. Nothing. So it's <laughs> uh, so it's 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 very exciting. Anything fun on your rider or backstage or for any of the guys or on your tour bus that we would be surprised to hear? No, oh, we're so boring. Come on, give me. I something. mean, like back Not in all the red <laughs> skittles or something. Crazy. Well, back in the day, there was a pretty funny thing because it. <clears throat> this sounded like a joke, and a lot of the venues would think we were kidding because it's kind of a common thing that bands put joke things on their rider. Like, I want 12 puppies and six llamas and whatever, and just see what the promoters will give you. And we never really did that, but I, you know, I used to wear a lot of ridiculous stage outfits. <laughs> and one of the things I needed, I had was condoms, lube, baby powder, and what was the other thing? Oh, cucumber. I mean, those all seem very normal and to me. And when you put those in a list together, <laughs> it looks a little bizarre. And a lot of the time, I wouldn't get those items, and I would have to go to the promoter and go, no, no, I genuinely need those. I can't get the dress on without the lube. The baby powders for, like, the weird the uncomfortableness of the dress tugging. The condom goes on my in-ear pack so I don't sweat through it and they don't cut out. Wow. But, and the cucumber is just because I really like cucumbers. So, uh, so that was, that was kind of funny. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. What advice would you give younger you? Um, I don't know. I would say, I don't know if advice would be the right word. I've never been one for advice. I've no? never one to really give it or take it. Um, I like that about you. <laughs> but, well, you live, you learn. You yeah. Know, there's no right or way, wrong way to do things. Um, I think I probably just would have said it's do what you're doing. I would have said do what you're doing. Like okay. it's going to seem impossible and it's going to seem crazy. And there's going to be moments where you're going to want to give up. And there's going to be moments where you're going to can't believe you're, you've made it there. Um, but just you're, you're on the right path and just stick to your guns. Because I think that that's... I've always tried to do that, um, and I think that that's kind of the only way to live life. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do that, then no matter what happens, you're always fulfilled. That's what I've I've kind of figured out. That if I make music for me, if I if I write songs for me, if I I do the things that make me happy, w regardless of success or anything outside of myself, like don't even let that kind of element enter my brain, right. which I really don't. Um, and it isn't always easy to do that. It isn't always easy to shut your mind off from the outside world, especially when creating, but I, I have to. Because if I make something for me, at the end of the day, that makes me feel good. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I'm doing it for. And then sharing it and all the other things that come after that that's just gravy. That's that's so secondary. And so if you, as an artist and as a person, if you're doing it for what I consider the right reasons, you'll never be disappointed. Okay. Because at the end of the day, I can sit at home in my tiny little apartment, which it is. It is a tiny little apartment on the Lower East Side and play a song, and that makes me happy. Right. And it's kind of that simple you at the end you. of the day. Yeah. I love it. All right, so before we get to some questions... I just want to know, will we, I mean, you're headed out on tour. Mm -hmm. You've had an amazing career that, to me, is just beginning, even though you've been doing it for a while. Will we see you have your music collide with fashion, cosmetics? I mean, you're, you're a whole brand. Are we going to see that? Am I? Soon? Um, <laughs> I hope so. Okay. I mean, I don't have exactly anything to tell you. Um, but I do love fashion. I do love makeup. And I know I think that all those things kind of go okay. hand in hand with music. Um, but I've been so busy pursuing the music that I have kind of forgotten about the rest of it. So okay. maybe, maybe one day We'll back burner it for back, a minute. We'll back burner that for cool. a second. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with of me. Course. I know everyone is very, very excited to sorry. have been here to I hang out with you. I had my back to you guys the whole time. I'm sorry. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we're going to open it up to some questions now. We'll do just a couple. Um, why don't you go ahead? And turn this way. Hi. Am I bringing their, the, a microphone? You just gonna answer? Okay, go ahead, project. You can stand up, yeah. You stand up. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, very cool.
Amazing. Oh yeah, no, great soundtracks can make a film. How do I feel about rock music being soundtracks to films? I think, I think, hell yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I, th I think a good song is a good song. I think I, obviously, this is no secret, I love rock and roll. And I think that, you know, the more uh, filmmakers like yourself that want to put that into movie, oops, excuse me. We almost lost Jeff. Just, you know, I'm klutzy as well. Um, who almost, who want to put that into, you know, the mainstream and films and share that. I think that's fucking awesome. Um, so, yeah, totally. And I think, and I also, you know, I think the soundtracks are, can make or break a film. So Agreed. Like, you know, you got to be specific with it. I don't think that you should necessarily cater your film to one genre unless that makes sense for your movie. Like, but, uh, but you know, do, but yeah, I, rock and roll and movies. Hell yeah. All right, she's into it. Okay. Thank you. Sit back how I was sitting. Okay, we have just time Thank for a couple you. more. And good luck with everything. Why don't you go ahead yeah. and stand up? What's your name? Ava. Okay, what's your question? What's your question? Hi. What song what? Describes your life. Ooh, that's a very good question. Well, right now the song that just popped into my head and we're about to go on tour is Rock and Roll <laughs> Star by Oasis, so let's go with that one. <laughs> Tonight I'm a rock and roll star. I love it. <laughs> go ahead. You couldn't stand up? Not that I consider myself a star, but... <laughs> Can you stand up? It's a fun song. Yeah, go ahead. What's your question? Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's okay. If I don't want to answer it, I'll just tell you. That's the cool <laughs> thing about being a grown-up. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> That's a very deep question. I think, <clears throat> well, you know, as a writer, I can only write what I know. I can only write what I've lived, what I've experienced, what I've observed. Um, you know, I can write stories, but, uh, you know, even those stories have to come from some sort of self-knowledge. Um, and so, uh, you know, to me, I write about life. And some, most of the time that's my life, sometimes it's not my life, sometimes it's people in my life. And with life comes death. You know, it's a very simple known fact around <laughs> the world. And so I think that that's always been this kind of consistent um, topic in, in my music because I don't think that you can write about life without writing about death. And I don't think you can write about death without writing about life. Um, and I think that it's certainly evolved now that I've experienced very difficult uh, personal experiences with death, and my perspective of it has now widened, unfortunately. Um, so it's it's transformed as I've gotten older and as my perception and my experiences have changed, um, and as I've grown as a person, I think that that's reflected in the songs. Um, and kind of the same thing as religion. I mean, religion a little bit, m a little bit less in the, se in the sense that I, I, grew, I was raised Catholic, um, and you know, I'm not a practicing religious person now, but uh, it, it was just a, something that I was taught. And so that kind of thinking, religion became a very easy metaphor. Easy is, again, the wrong word, but a very simple metaphor that everyone could understand of good and bad, you know, um, heaven and hell. Like they're, they're kind of simple ways to express these drastic uh, juxtapositions, kind of like life and death. And so that became a common theme in 
especially going to hell, uh, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also, you know, highway to hell, going to hell. It's all rock and roll. Come I think on. people took that a little too literally. I, I looked around and just went, ACDC, anyone? Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I don't all know right. if that answered your question, but. I have one more, guys. I'm really sorry. Honey, go ahead, honey. You can stand up. Yep. Hi, how are you? I love your jeans. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to know what about them was so inspiring to make them in that person. Um, well, first of all, they're all inc- well, good question. And first of all, they're they're all incredible. It's the simple answer. Um, you know, icons. Uh, but um, the the common theme there was I was I was this record was written like I said earlier was when I was 24, 25, and so I was and I was in a very dark place in my life, and I was not so sure. We've all heard the lore of the 27 Club, and I was not so sure that I was going to make it there. And so that kind of um, fear or looming uh, thing, whatever you want to call it, was was very prevalent in my mind, and so Rock and Roll Heaven is is references, you know, in the chorus, gotta make it to 27 before I die. Um, those All those artists passed at the age of 27, um, except for, well, yeah, no, they, yes. <laughs> leave it there. I'll leave it there. So that's that was the kind of common theme there um, of bringing that, tying that in. All right. And they were all artists that I listened to growing up and, and love. So that's the other easy way to do it. And it poetically sounded good. And there's a billion reasons and why lyrics are worked, written. Okay? And it just works. And, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a puzzle, writing songs. Taylor Momsen, this has been such an incredible evening. Let's give her a round of applause. We're so excited Thanks, for Death by Rock and Roll. <laughs> obsessed with it. Obsessed with you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for taking the time out tonight. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming. This has been super fun. I didn't know what to expect. This is interesting. First thing I've done like this, I think. Um, and yeah, we're going on tour. So if you want to have on even tour. more fun, come see a show. <laughs> Thank you, love. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. <laughs>